Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome. Come and take a seat. There's plenty to choose from. We, um, we recognise that we're very low numbers-wise here in church this morning. And that's absolutely fine. A lot of people will be connecting online through the live stream, and it's good that we have the choice to be able to do that. We will uh, keep church open, uh, even if it's just a handful of people here physically with us in the building, we want to be able to give people the choice, um, but we also want people to feel safe and to make sure that they are safe. And uh, just to let you all know, I've, uh, I've been very blessed with the vaccine this week, um, so I've, I've been and had my number one jab, and uh, it, was, it was okay, I felt like I had a bit of a dead arm, there don't seem to be any side of Side, side effects, but um, it's, uh, it was okay, so I got myself on a key worker's spares list, and uh, I literally just get a text message, and they say, come down and have it, so I went and had it, but, um, and praise God for that. I just want to bring a couple of verses to you as we, as we start our service this morning, as we come to a place of worship. Because I, I was just talking with a couple of people before the service about this, actually. But one thing I've noticed is that there is a huge amount of fear around at the moment. There seems to be more fear and anxiety uh, relating to the virus around now than there was right at the beginning when this thing was new. Um, it, it seems like that, that sort of anxiety level has really ramped up. And uh, yes, we know that we have... Uh, Jesus, we know that we're on the winning side. We know that even if we uh, leave this earthly plane, we will be with him in heaven. We know that. What did Paul say? He said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. But we still are human and we still struggle with fear and anxiety. And I want to just share a couple of verses with you from different parts of the Bible this morning. Isaiah 41.10 says, fear not. For I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Let me read that again in the first part of that. Fear not, I am with you. Philippians 4, verses 6 to 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. Psalm 56, verse 3. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God gave us not a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. Would you stand with me? Deuteronomy 31, 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread. Psalm 34, verse 4. I saw the Lord, and he answered me, and he delivered me from my fears. We are on the victory side of the church. We are on the victory side. Let me tell you this. Yes, the virus is very real. Yes, we have to be cautious. Yes, we must take the proper precautions. We must use our face mark and point it down there. We'll ask the floor over there. Yes, we must use our face masks. Yes, we must use our social distancing and all of those measures and wash our hands and everything like that. The Old Testament is full of practical measures about keeping the people safe from disease and illness. That's what a large part of the Levitical law and all of those things is about. It is practical measures to keep people safe and we must do that. But at the same time, we must know that our trust is in God and we do not succumb to fear. So let's come to a place of worship this morning. Father, we give you our fears. Would you pray this prayer with me? And if you, I'm not just going to pray. If you, if you agree with this prayer, just say amen at the end of me. Father, this morning we give you our fears. We give you our anxieties. We give you the things which trouble our hearts. We give you the chains of worry that bind our lives. 
Lord, we declare this morning that we do not want any part of them. And we give them over to you. And we stand upon your word, which says, fear not, for I am with you. Lord, we know that you are with us. We know that you walk with us. And we give you every part of ourselves this morning. In Jesus' precious name. Amen.
it's always good to pray scripture. It's always good to connect with God through his word. So I just want to ask if we can share the Lord's prayer together this morning. Just feel free just to speak this out as we do this together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I don't know why I always refer back to King James English when I pray that prayer. I don't know why I said it's a uh, trespass instead of sins. Still use the nine, it's just how I learned the prayer when I was young. But you know, there was a friend of mine who was part of our church in Ringwood. He was a soldier during the Falklands War. And he shared his testimony one day. He said that he was um, he was on a landing craft and they were heading across the, the sea towards uh, the Falklands and there was a British battleship a few miles off the coast and their radio communications went down, everything went down and they were aware that this battleship couldn't distinguish between them and the enemy fleet and the battleship didn't know that there were friendly vessels in the water and it started to fire missiles across at these landing, at the British landing craft. And he said he'd never been so scared in his life. He wasn't a Christian at that point in time. And he said he knelt down in that boat and he just started praying the Lord's Prayer because it's the only prayer he knew. He learned at school. And he said before he knew what was happening, the entire boat, well, it just seemed like it, all the people around him were praying the same prayer. God steps in when we step up. Switch.
wonder if there's anybody that would like to share a word of testimony with us this morning. Is there anybody here today who would like to come and share something that Jesus is doing in your life right now? I'll tell you what I'll do, I'm going to speak to Heather afterwards and just find out the, which issue that is and then maybe we can uh, put it on the website and make more wants or we can, we can get some more for you because that's, that's really precious, thank you Heather. Anybody else that would like to share this morning before we come around God's word? Okay, okay let's, uh, let's come around God's word right now, have we got any more? We've got another, oh, we've got another song. Yeah, should we have another song? Or should we have a, let's have another song. Alright. Let's let's stand in worship together. See this is what happens when we don't communicate.
unless there is a distinction in the notes. Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? So it is with you, unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you are saying? You will just be speaking into the air. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I'm a foreigner to the speaker, and they are a foreigner to me. So it is with you. Since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in the gifts that build up the church. So, I was speaking on prophecy this morning, I had a whole other message arranged for you this week, and literally last night, about 10.30, I, I had a kind of nagging in my spirit all day that I needed to bring something different, and about 10.30 last night, I just, I just knew that God wanted me to speak on this subject of prophecy, so uh, I'm going to be in my notes a little bit more than I might normally be this morning, because I just really want to follow what I've got on the page. But there is, why do I want to speak on prophecy? Why do I want to bring teaching on the gift of prophecy this morning? And I've actually asked uh, Pastor Malcolm if he will speak on the same subject next week. And I've done that because it is so important that we have an understanding around the gift of prophecy. Because there is so much coming out at the moment from well-known Christian speakers or those who present themselves as Christian speakers about stuff that is happening in the world right now. There are so many prophecies, I use the term loosely, there are so many prophecies coming out around COVID-19. There are so many prophecies coming out around the vaccine, again I use the term loosely. There were so many prophecies just a couple of weeks ago about the whole US election issue with Trump and Biden. And I'm not being political when I talk about this. It is not a political issue. It is a theological issue. There were Christian speakers, and again, I use the term loosely, prophesying that something would happen on the, uh, on the inauguration day. And that, uh, that, that, that something would happen to Biden and that Trump would arise. And they were speaking this out clearly that it would happen. And of course, it didn't. The devil is having a field day at the moment with this pandemic of false prophecy, which is out there right now. And we need to be able to tell true prophecy from false. We need to be able to tell and distinguish the voice of God from the voice of the devil, the father of lies. Deuteronomy 18 verse 22 says, If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously. That means they've spoken from themselves, not from God. He goes on to say, so, so do not be alarmed. That means take no notice of it. For they are a false prophet. Now this is no different today than it was 2,000 years ago when Paul wrote this letter to the church. Paul had planted this church in Corinth in Acts chapter 18 and it had taken off and it had taken off well. People were being saved and that is what really counts in church life. Sam, obviously these guys aren't here today, uh, some of them are self-isolated, I'm aware of that, but we know that, I say these guys, I'm pointing to this section because this is where Sam and the guys usually sit, but we know that people have been saved, at least five people have come to Jesus since Christmas Day, and that matters in church life, salvation matters. But Paul had moved on, he moved on from Corinth to Ephesus. But whilst he was there, whilst he was in Ephesus, he learns of some serious issues in the church back in Corinth. There are people involved in sin issues. There are people arguing with each other. And there are people struggling to comprehend and get their heads around the spiritual gifts. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? So Paul is addressing these issues. He's instructing the people how to live in love, both for one another and 
in love for Christ. And he brings instruction on how to deal with sin in the church. And he brings teaching on the spiritual gifts so that the people may be left in no doubt as to the right direction to move in for the spiritual health of the church, the bride of Christ. And for then the further salvation of those outside of the church. But remember, this teaching that Paul is bringing here is not evangelistic in nature. It is teaching, it is pastoral in nature in this particular occasion. It's, uh, it's corrective, it, it's discipling, uh, and that is the aim of this letter. Aim to the body of Christ, not for those outside of the body at this time. Why? Because when the church is correct, it creates a craving for the Creator. When the church is heading in the right direction, people start to yearn for God, they connect with God, and that is when stuff starts to happen. Why do I mention this? Because God takes this stuff very, very seriously. And Paul warns of the dangers of false prophecy, and of us not weighing prophecy correctly. 2 Timothy 4, he says this, verse 3. For the time is coming when people will not enjoy sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off to myths. The world will bring you all types of teaching or prophecy. There are all sorts of ideas and beliefs out there. And some of it will come from what appears to be reputable Christian sources. But you must always, 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 without question, bring it back and weigh it against the Word of God. Yes? Every word of prophecy that you hear must be weighed against the Word of God. And we should do that with each prophecy that we hear or read. 1 Thessalonians 5 says this, Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to what is good and avoid every type of evil. In other words, take the meat and throw out the bones. Jesus himself warns us of the dangers of false prophecy. In Matthew 7, 15, he says, Beware of false prophets who come to you as sheep, uh, sorry, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Ravenous wolves do not want to feed the sheep, they want to feed on the sheep. They want to feed themselves with the sheep. False prophets use people in churches for their own gain, and then they spit out the bones. True prophecy, true prophecy should always glorify Jesus. Amen? Revelation 19.10 says, For the essence of prophecy is to give a clear witness for Jesus. This also coincides with Jesus' own statement that the Holy Spirit would arrive and would glorify Him in John 16 verse 14. Prophecy brings nurturing, not negativity. It raises, it never ruins. In verse 1, Paul tells us to eagerly desire the spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Why desire this gift especially? Verse 4, because the one who prophesies edifies the church. So this morning, if I am to bring a word of prophecy to you, or if Pastor Malcolm brings a word of prophecy to you, or if Clive or Karen or anybody else brings a word of prophecy to you, then that word should be one which edifies, builds up, raises up the body of Christ. Now that can be edifying, building up, and raising up a single believer. Doesn't necessarily mean the body as a whole. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So a word of prophecy can be for a single person or it can be for the whole body. Derek Prince teaches well on this subject. He says this, 
The gift of prophecy is the supernaturally imparted ability to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and to speak God's mind or counsel. Prophecy ministers not only to the assembled group of believers, but also to individuals. Prophecy lifts. Prophecy builds. 1 Corinthians 14.3 But everyone who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. So if you hear an apparent word of prophecy and it doesn't strengthen you, if it doesn't encourage you, if it doesn't comfort you, or if it doesn't strengthen, encourage, or comfort the church, if it degrades or belittles or discourages, then quite simply that is not a word from God and we need to throw it out. This doesn't mean that prophecy cannot bring discipline or be corrective. It doesn't mean that it can't address behavior or attitudes in the church or even in the nation that need to be addressed. A parent who loves their child won't let them do whatever they want without correcting their behavior. Because we love our children, we want them to be on the right path in life, and that is the same with God. When He loves us, because, or rather because He loves us, He brings correction, He brings direction, He brings discipline. Proverbs 3 verse 12 says, For whom the Lord loves, He reproves. Even as the father corrects the son in whom he delights. However, when a word of correction is brought, it is never from a haughty or patronizing or condescending heart. A true prophet is heartbroken by sin. They never revel in sin or in the fall of others. Because God doesn't revel in sin or in the, in the fall of others. In Ezekiel chapter 3, Ezekiel was appointed by God as a watchman over Israel. But he sat in sorrow amongst the exiles in Tel Aviv for seven days in utter misery. He wasn't lofting or looking down his nose at them. He sat among them. His heart was broken. He was wounded for a people who had turned their back on God. How does prophecy operate? Well, two things I see in scripture prophecy does. Prophecy foretells and prophecy tells forth. Foretelling is to declare a thing which can only know, be known by divine revelation. To declare the divine will or interpret the purposes of God or to make the truth of God plainly known and understood by the listener. Foretelling is the declaration of future events as revealed from the Lord, pertaining especially to his kingdom and to the things surrounding his kingdom. So prophecy tells forth. That is speaking God's mind, speaking God's counsel into a situation. It is not simply the wisdom of a man or a woman or even good and wise leadership. It is supernatural. It is the supernatural Holy Spirit given gift of being able to speak the heart of God into a situation at a personal level, at a church level, at a government or national level, or even at an international level. But remember where we came to from Deuteronomy. If what the prophet speaks does not come to pass, then they're a false prophet. That is the benchmark for prophecy. This is serious. When John the Baptist preached down in the wilderness of Judea, in Matthew 3, he cried out, Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. He was telling forth the heart of God for his people to come to him in repentance for their salvation. When Peter and John stood before the religious court in Acts chapter 4, it says this, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, 
whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Peter was turned forth with boldness, the heart of God, through the Holy Spirit at that time. But prophecy also foretells. This is often regarded as the, the New Testament gift of words of knowledge. If you look at 1 Corinthians 12 verse 8, it's listed there. Some people see it as the same gift. Some people see it as separate prophetic gifts. But whichever way you look at it, it speaks the supernatural revelation of God into situations which are either past, present, or future. So when Peter exposed Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5 for having lied about their offering, that was a word of knowledge or prophecy about the past. It was about something which had happened from which they could have no natural knowledge. When the prophets at Antioch had a word of knowledge that Barnabas and Paul were to be separated for the work of God in Acts chapter 13, that was a word of knowledge about the present. It was a word of prophecy about the present. And probably the most famous of all, the book of Revelation, we looked at it earlier on, at, at late last year, when John was in the Holy Spirit on Patmos, he received revelation from God about the end times, and that was, of course, a word of prophecy about the future. But whichever way we look at it, whichever way we divide up the gifts into our understanding of them, I know this, the Holy Spirit desires, the Holy Spirit desires that we operate in the prophetic gifts. That is so clear from our passage. God desires to speak his mysteries, to speak his truths through you. And to prophetically declare his love to a hurting world that is in such desperate need of him. Is that not true today? God desires you to speak out prophetically of him. He doesn't want you to be afraid to do that. He wants you to speak into people's lives. He wants you to speak into people's situations. He wants you to speak the heart of God into his church, into his people, into your family, into your work situations, into your financial situations, whatever they are. He wants you to be bold enough to step out and move in his Holy Spirit. Not only does Paul encourage us to do this in our passage, 1 Corinthians 14, 12, so it is with you, you since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in the gifts that build up the church. But Peter also proclaimed it the moment the Holy Spirit fell. Acts 2, 17, he says this, In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. I don't know if I'm a vision or a dreamer yet. Am I young or old? I, I, I think I'm somewhere in the middle. I'm not sure. Even on that, or even on my male servants and my female servants. You see, this this this, this gifts of God knows no boundaries regarding gender, it knows no boundaries regarding age, it knows no boundaries regarding your background, your nationality, or any of those things. If you know Jesus, he wants to move through you by the power and presence of his Holy Spirit. Even on my male servants and my female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. I wonder today, will you dare to allow a supernatural God to work in you, in dreams and in visions and in prophecies in these last days. Will you dare to step out and proclaim the things of the Holy Spirit when you are filled with His fire? Will you allow Him to access your innermost hidden places of your heart and to bring them into his tender care. His Holy Spirit is the comforter. 
He doesn't want your discomfort. He desires your obedience and your openness before his throne. What he will reveal into your heart will revolutionize your relationship. Don't be afraid of prophecy. But test it. Weigh it. Use your common sense. Use scripture. Put it into context. Anything you hear, whenever any person stands up and says, I bring this word to you, this is what the Lord, the Lord says. Does it meet up with scripture? Does it flow with scripture or does it contradict scripture? Does it edify and build up the church? Does it encourage? If it brings discipline or correction, does it do so in a constructive manner in line with the word of God? Or is it simply a howling of a wolf dressed up in sheep's clothing? Do you stand with me? Bringing you this teaching today because there is a need. There is a need for understanding on these real basics of God. And it's good to go over them. It's good to look at them. Pastor Malcolm is going to bring us the same subject from a different angle next week. Father, today, bring us into your presence. Speak to us and speak through us. Make us who we need to be in this hurting, frightened, and troubled world. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord make his face shine.